As we went around last night in our various darim and our various meals, some of you might have had a matzah seder, which means under 18 minutes. <laughs> some of you might have had a chameit seder, went like until 3 in the morning. Whatever your seder was, I'm sure at some point you had to do what Rama Gamliel says is the mitzvah in the Torah, is to look at the matzah and say, matzah zu shanu ochlim ashuma. Rabbi Gamliel, the great rabbi of the Talmudic era, we were responsible to look at the matzah and the maror and the Pesach and to say, what is this for? These three symbols are the most important symbols, he writes, or he has transmitted to us. These are the three symbols that the Paschal meal is all about. So we're to point to something and say, what is this for? Which, of course, is the theme for the entire evening. Right, we begin the evening with asking ma, manishtana, and by the time we've arrived at the Pesach and the Matzah and the Maror, we say, al shuma, what is this for? Al shuma, ma, what's this all about? So I don't know about you, if you read about the Matzah, it's called Lechem Oni. It's a symbol of our affliction. Some people call it the bread of Oni, of affliction or of poverty. But yet if you look at what Rabbi Gamliel says is the reason for the matzah. The reason for the matzah, according to Rabbi Gamliel, is what? The Torah gives us the reason. Shalom, he speak bit, say, come, that our dough is, we didn't have enough time for it to rise. We were rushing. We were balachat. We were rushing out. And so we eat this matzah to remind us, not of our affliction, necessarily, but of our hurried state. That's kind of a good thing. Liberation was possible and there was a window that opened and we said, you know what, if we don't get out that window, we're ne it's gonna close. We better get out and we better hurry. So we eat the matzah to remind us that sometimes the window to liberation and freedom is very, very temporally small. You have a moment and if you don't grab that moment, the matzah tells you, you missed your matzah moment. Right, that matzah moment was brought to you by Hurry up. The jig is up and gone. But what does that have to do with affliction? We call it lechem oni in the beginning of the, right? We call it halach ma'anya in Aramaic. We say, right, in the beginning of the Seder, we take this matzah before we even begin the manishtana. We break, right? We break. We're going to hold up the matzah. And we look at it and we go, ha in Aramaic, which of course was the lingua franca. It's like saying it in English. This is the bread of oni, of affliction. Right, so we halach ma anya. This is the bread of anya, of oni, of affliction, of poverty, and a lot of reasons given for that. The rabbis say the word oni here, meaning affliction, really is from the word one, which means to give answers. This is the bread upon which we give answers, because we're going about to answer the question of the child who says, Manishtana, so lechem she'onim alev alav dvarim harbei. This is the bread upon which many answers are offered because it's broken, and once it's broken, answers flow from that broken place. But another reason that it is the bread of affliction, according to Rav Kook, the great first rabbi of Palestine, is entirely connected to the rush state of leaving. Rav Kook reads... Lechem only the bread of affliction through the prism of Shalom. He speak beit sekam, that their dough didn't have time to rise. He connects these two moments. Not just a reminder of like, hey, sometimes you only have a little bit of a window, but no, sometimes lachat itself, pressure, is itself what is required in order for freedom to be born. He reads it beautifully. I just want to read a little bit of this in his lyrical, beautiful Hebrew which is hard to understand even if you know Hebrew, and if you don't, just wait for the translation. Says there are two paths in organic growth or evolution and elevation. He calls Roman Muto, like the, the, the majestic elevation of humanity and of life. Says that life itself will, has to burst forth with its own vitality and its own strength. 
He says, one path towards our own evolution and growth is when there's plenty, abundance. Man, you got so much time. Time to read, time to grow, time to feel, time to be loved, time to make decisions, to weigh, to think about it, to create spreadsheets. You got so much time. You have scenario planning. It's like, you know, time. Time. So much time, he says. The money says that that spaciousness allows a shetef, like a flow, a strong flow, to you know to grow and to grow. He says that there's another path towards growth, that's its exact antithetical or theoretical opposite. It's completely 180 degrees. Not spaciousness and time, but rather says the holding back, the pressure, the absolute right obstacle that won't allow that thing to come forward, that holds it back, that's imprisoned. But then when it's time arrives for it now to be released, it releases itself in either greater capacity than it might have been if it had not been held back. Lachatz. And he says, powerfully he says, this is the meaning of course when God says to Moses, I've heard the cry of my people because Pharaoh has been subjecting them. Lachat Sehem, Pharaoh has been giving them lachats. They've been under tremendous power, pressure and under a pressure cooker. In Rav Cook's reading here, this is the difference between a world in which it's vertive, it is verdant and furtive the entire year, and a place where you have a hard winter. And the cold of the winter holds back the seeds from growing. Blossoming is not happening until the right moment when the sun and the spring emerge. And then everything bursts forth, he says. This is the meaning of Pesach. A Pesach that comes after a hard winter. Lachatz and pressure. In this way, he reads the matzah. And so beautifully, we had somebody in class this week notice that in the word matzah, and the word Mitzrayim, Mitzrayim and Matzah both begin with two letters, Mem and Sadi, and so does Chametz. Chametz also has two letters, the same two letters. And the difference between Chametz and Matzah is not the two letters, Mem, Tzadik, but the He or the Chet. That the ingredients of leavening and the ingredients of Matzah are pretty much two out of three, exactly the same. And even Mitzrayim, the first two letters of the word Egypt or narrowness, he says, Egypt is the ultimate narrow place where things are being held as if in a pressure cooker. And someone said that's what Tzimtzum is, isn't it? In the Kabbalistic idea that the world was created when God did Tzimtzum, God did concentrated, intense, inner pressure. The word Latzum, which means to fast, means to concentrate things, the same letters, Tzom, Tzimtzum. It's hard not to feel at this moment like we are all in a pressure cooker. It's hard not to feel after the last two years if you're like me. You're living in something that feels like every now and then you get a little harchava, a little opening, and then it gets back to being closed again. Just when you thought you could, and then you get closed in again. It's hard not to feel that the intensification of energies in one place, like the Rav Cook's idea that all evolutional growth happens in two ways, it could happen with this really big, broad, un, you know, and sp expansive space. It can also happen, he says, when we feel held back, we feel obstacles, we feel completely that we're gonna, we're gonna explode. It's hard to know when you're in the middle of Tsim Tsum that there's something that's coming after it. It's hard to know in the winter that lying beneath the snow, there's a seed that will become the rose. It's hard to know when we are being intensely tzimtzumed and asked to draw in and draw in and draw in that there's also something that comes at the other side. 
Maybe this is also why the Zohar calls the matzah the bread of not only affliction and not only of, of expansive reminder of the hurried state, but the bread of faith. In the Zohar HaKadosh, the matzah is called michla de mehemnusa, the bread of emuna, of to be faithful. Maybe it's because in the intense moments of tzimtzum, when we're asked to withstand tremendous pressures, it's hard to know that there actually will be a spring that's coming. That's the faith. We have no idea when we're eating the matzah last night and during this holiday what it is that we're praying for, but maybe we might pray that no matter where we have pressure in our lives, that that pressure might be for the sake of our promise. That pressure is for the sake of the promise being made manifest in us through that pressure. That we might be able to withstand the pressure that we've been put under for the sake of our own ultimate redemption and liberation, for the sake of our families and our culture and our society. Maybe in some way Rav Kook is pointing us towards yet another kavana, yet another intention as we eat the bread of faith that we might have faith in those moments where it seems as though the seeds that have been planted might never come to fruition, that they might come to fruition, that they might have the light of day, they might see freedom and see and know what it is that they have been pressurized for. What promise is it that will be kept when spring erupts? Here's to all of those under pressure that they might know the promise that they are being cooked for. Here's to all of those in our lives and in the society at large that they also might have the taste of looking back and saying, ah, that matzah, matzah zu, she'anochlim, that matzah that we ate, it was for the sake of this moment. Please rise as we conclude the davening with Aleinu, which can be found on page 57.